I know there are a couple of folks scheduled to be here who are not yet arrived. Three, four, five, six, seven, nope. I know Al is joining us. <coughs> Just another couple of minutes if you be patient. Bob? Yes? I know Mark Berkowitz is trying to get in. I, I forwarded him the link, so he may be coming in under my name. He's here. <laughs> oh, there. OK, there he is. Got him. Great. Hey, Mark. Looks like we have two Nancys today. <laughs> <laughs> Can never have too many Nancys. <laughs> We're going to get started in just a minute. <clears throat> Want to give Al a second, uh, keep an eye out for him in case he's having trouble. Yep, I am. Hang on. Okay. He might be on that. You see any side of him? Yeah, I think I just I think he's he's phoning in, correct? Uh, I asked him I asked him to unmute. Good. He should okay. be on. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. I think we see him here. Uh, Al, you are muted. I asked him to unmute. Yep. Just let us know you can hear us. We'll get started. And Rafi said he will uh, may not be able to make it, but he's going to try to call in. Uh, Al, you're still muted. Um, Ask to unmute. I did. Yeah. Well, let's hope he can hear us. Uh, can you unmute him, Bob? You should be able to. 
I did. I tried. I just hit ask to, ask to unmute, and it's not. Uh, I'll do it one more time. Unmute muted. There we go. Okay. Al, can you hear us? Al, can you hear us? They're asking me, can you hear them? Al, I think we hear you, and here's Rafi. I'll be trying on your phone now. All right, well, it is 10.06, we're recording. We will um, open the meeting. Good morning, welcome, happy spring. Um, we have, um, hey. there we go. Hi, Al, glad you're with us. Hi, John. Okay, I'm gonna Great. end this. Um, so we have, um, some guests from uh, CHFA here um, this morning. Um, Marcus is hardly a guest having been here often. We're delighted to have you back. Uh, and um, uh, Lisa, um, welcome. Uh, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, hi, I'm, um, I'm Lisa Cooper and I work at Shafa, and I am, uh, my, my current role and responsibility is working on the My Home CT program. That is Connecticut's half program. And um, when you get to me on the agenda, I'll talk a little bit about what that program is and, and how I can you know, help, help your, uh, your folks. Super. Um, and uh, folks from the department, um, if with your indulgence, we'll let um, uh, Marcus and, and Lisa go first, and then Pamela, um, you next, and then Cynthia, how's that? Good morning, this is Pamela, sounds fine with me. Cynthia, Good you morning. okay? Yes, I'm here, that, that's fine with me too. Okay, great. Well, we never follow the order of the agenda, perhaps we should <laughs> change it. Uh, uh, we first order of business is the approval of the minutes of December 8th. Can I have a motion to approve? Motion made to approve the minutes. And second, please. Somebody, please. I'll second. Thank you. Uh, any corrections, additions? I have one. <laughs> Since we never follow the order of the agenda, the last paragraph on page two um, is somewhat misleading. Uh, it has me leaving the meeting at the beginning, even though I'm then uh, mentioned throughout the rest of it. I left just before it ended, um, but uh, with that correction, I think the minutes are fine. Um, all in favor? Aye. Opposed, abstained, minutes are approved. So why don't we go right to, let me just make sure it's nothing else. Uh, yeah, what, why don't we go right to the folks from CHFA and uh, Colette, any particular order in which you want to uh, address these issues? No, please, I'll turn it over to Marcus and Lisa. They can start us off. Thank you. Um, okay, Marcus, I'll I'll start off with um, my home CT, and then you can follow follow up with um, what you have. So again, I'm I'm Lisa, and I uh, Cooper at uh, from Chapa, and I am working um, to roll out the my home CT program for the state of Connecticut. So that is um, a program that we're we're administering on behalf of DOH, and that's the homeowner assistance fund money that states and territories are getting from the federal government from the um, from the ARPA Act. 
So um, why I'm here today is because I wanted to make sure that you guys know that delinquent land lease or lot payments are considered a qualified expense under the program that Connecticut is, is rolling out. Um, so that's, uh, that can be um, a reinstatement to, to bring the, them current, or it can also be up to 12 months of, of forward payment assistance up to the program total of, of $30,000. And this is grant money, so there, there's not a, a repayment requirement. Um, there are some restrictions around the program. The property needs to be owner-occupied, your primary residence owner-occupied. The household income needs to be at or below 150% of the AMI adjusted for household size. The hardship needs to be a COVID related, the financial hardship needs to be a COVID related financial hardship. Um, that's a self certification. We're not looking for hard proof for that, just the self certification. Um, I mentioned it's a maximum grant uh, up to $30,000 that payments would be made directly to the creditor, so the landlord or whoever is administering that that lease or that that rent, um, and like I said, it can be a reinstatement and or up to twelve months of payments, just as long as we're not exceeding that that thirty thousand cap. Wow. Um, Want to encourage you guys and and anybody that you're talking to to sign up at www.shafa.org slash myhomect for updates and program announcements. That's the best way to get information as soon as it's um, available. And I'll put that in the chat for you. Um, so if anybody has some questions, I can can take them uh, if you if I if I want if you want some clarification on something. So it hey, looks Lisa. like Yeah Lisa, thank you very much. This is uh, extraordinarily good news. <laughs> um, can you give us just a ballpark sense of when the program will open and when it will expire? Sure. So Connecticut was allocated $123 million for to, to run the program. So um, we need to spend it before 2025. So the program will end when the money runs out or that uh, September, September of 2025. Um, and we're we're anticipating a rollout in the next uh, month or so. And like I said, the best place to stay up to date is that is to sign up for the updates on the website. We're currently working on you know building out our infrastructure so that we can make the application process and uh, application review and funding process as um, as smooth and automated as possible. It will be. I didn't mention this. It will it will primarily be an online application. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and if folks need assistance, we will have resource centers uh, that folks can go to around the state. And we'll also have a call center um, and either the resource center or the call center can like hop into the application with that person and like really walk them through. So it's very hands on help. Um, the resource center will have, you know, physical help. Like if you need a computer to help fill out the application or if you need some help scanning and uploading your income documentation, for instance, that will have resource centers around the state who can help folks with, you know, answer questions about the program or provide that technical assistance. That's, so. that's fantastic. Um, yeah. Could you also just tell us ballpark what 150% of the uh, income level would be for a family of two? It depends on your zip code. It depends on your, your, your uh, town. Pick an average. Uh, <laughs> pick an average. Yeah, let, let me g just give me a, a moment and let me just pull that um, grid up. I just give me a second here. Uh, income. Lisa, I can work on that if you want to keep answering questions. I, I, yeah, I think it's going to be around 100. Uh, uh, yeah, it looks like 150 AMI for a household of two is ranging from. 123,000 up to, I see like in Stanford, for instance, it's like 180,000. Whoa. So it's, yeah. That's amazing. So. Uh, Lisa? Yeah. Hey, so can you answer two questions for me? One is um, if somebody has already applied through Unite CT and has been given some money in the past, does that preclude them from participating in this program? So what we won't 
do is if they receive some assistance for, you know, months one, two, three, four, five, we wouldn't provide assistance for months one, two, three, four, five. We would provide, you know, maybe assistance for, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, something like that. Like we won't, you know, pay for the same thing two times. Okay. And the Unite CT program require the landlords to do a significant amount of work to participate. Is it the same for this program? No, um, there's no landlord um, component to the the My Home CT program. So, you know, well, I guess the component is that we will be looking for um, a ledger, a W-9 from them, and we'll be looking for a statement, but there is no application um, piece for the landlord to do for My Home CT. Nice. Yeah, makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. And what 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 is the requirement? You said, let's say someone is four or five months delinquent and they apply. What is the requirement for them? You said it can go up to 12 months going forward. I mean, what is the determining factor on that? So we're asking a series of questions in the application. And one of the questions is, you know, do you need help bring yourself current? Do you need help making forward payments? So it's really some self-certification questions that the applicant is walking through as they as they complete the application. <clears throat> Just to clarify, so if the if the applicant says that they're in arrears and they need help going forward, they can qualify for all of the arrears plus the 12 months, as long as it doesn't exceed 30,000. That's correct. Um, is it determining if they've gone back to work or um, so along those lines or anything? Yeah, so like I said, we are doing some self-certification um, as far as need. We are collecting income. Uh, uh, we're, we're, we're asking the folks to, for any household member who has income, they would record that income in the application and they would supply the income documentation. Um, one caveat to that, if this, if it's a qualified census tract, we are uh, collecting income and, and letting the applicant certify the household income. And we are not requiring income documentation like pay stubs or tax returns or anything like that. So that's just for qualified census tracts. Um, does that help? Yeah, I mean, I have multiple folks that work in the restaurant business that obviously mm -hmm. are, are coming back into employment, but mm -hmm. were unemployed for quite a bit of time. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to figure out is um, how that plays in. You know, if they're, they're starting back perhaps part-time and then going to full-time and, yep. you know, so they're self-certifying that they can or cannot, you know, make their forward payments. We're not doing a deep dive underwrite and and you know calculating debt to income and housing to income things like that. So right. it is a self-certification. So, so okay. Miriam, if people um, fell behind during the two years of the pandemic and are now working, even making their regular salary, that doesn't mean they've dug out of a hole. They could still self-certify that they have difficulty making their forward payments. So um, correct. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to kind of be clear on what you just said about going forward and going backwards. When you said that 12 months, 12 months is the limit on going forward, yep. but there is, is there a limit on going on arrearages? <clears throat> sure. So we will <clears throat> not pay, a re we will not pay um, an arrearage past October of 2019, right? So it's COVID related uh, arrearages that, that we're working, that we're trying to cure with this grant. Okay, and, that, and that the arrearage amount, the number of months of arrearage does not count against the 12 months going forward. That is a correct statement. It does not count. And is the application that you make a one-time application in the sense that, I mean, let's say that someone is, um, is, I don't know, is behind, is five months behind mm -hmm. and, and they apply, um, but they think they're gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe they need one or two months forward right now. Is what they would do is apply for 12 months forward or can they apply for two months forward? And then when it turns out 
they they need more of those 12 months they could reapply for the for the balance so what we do is we say we'll we'll pay there's it would be up to 12 months and we would we would say we're going to approve this grant for, for up to 12 months, assuming the program cap dollar does, isn't exceeded. So then what happens is there's a recertification process every quarter that this applicant will just, you know, log into their account and answer a question. Do you need continued assistance? You know, yes or no. And if they say no, then we would stop their assistance. If they say yes, we'll continue it up to that 12 months. Okay. And they, but, but they can't, and they cannot, but once they've said no, they're not going to be able to reapply. They can reapply, they would be starting all over. It would be a brand new application, but again, they they can exceed the program maximum. So so it, they could have had a second a, a hardship occur, right? They, next month, you know, so we've helped somebody, we've, you know, got them up current, they're, they're, they're good. And then, you know, two months from now, some, some other COVID related hardship occurs. They could reapply. So and you said I'm sorry. The cert, the recertification would be monthly, quarterly. Quarterly, quarter. Okay. Yep. So the, so they're being kind of it's three months at a time. Is in terms of people. Not, so, and in, in the context of a, a mobile home park where you're owning the unit and leasing mm -hmm. the land. Yeah. Um, you, you, there, there are two kinds of debts you might have. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might have an arrearage in the lease, mm -hmm. park owner. And you might have an arrearage in your purchase price from, mm -hmm. which might have been from the park owner, or might have been from somebody else. You bought it mm -hmm. from some company that sells mobile homes. How do those two interrelate with each other in terms of this so, program? Sure. So if you if there was an applicant who needed both of those types of assistance, we would evaluate the application for both of those types of assistance. And so then we would be paying. <laughs> Uh, ABC Bank, right, for the, the purchase of the mobile home, right? And then we would be paying the park owner the, the land lease piece. But again, together, we can't exceed that 30000 So and, and together, you can't exceed 12 months going forward. Correct. But, That's you, could the do it, but you could do an arrearage on both. Correct. Without, without any, other than the October 2019. Mm -hmm. the, uh, um how would now you said you you, you said that the, the 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 property owner the landlord in our context here the park owner doesn't have any direct role in this so how would the the resident even know about this program what, what's the what's the what, what's the where where might the 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 park owner fit in um and how if for example, does the park owner need to be the primary entity that tells people about the program? I mean, they have, they know at least as to rents, whether a person's in arrears or not, um, or and they, they presumably have a communication system with the residents. Is that what you're looking for as the primary way of finding out, or is there going to be some other way? I mean, you, the CHFA has de developed a mailing list, I believe, of every mobile home Park resident in the state, is is CHFA going to take the initiative and communicate with with residents? So my question is, how's anybody going to find out about this? Yeah, I, I can sure. jump in, Rafi. So I was you, just going to say, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you actually you you nailed it, Rafi. We do have that list of eight thousand plus residents who are park owners in state licensed parks. So we'll be similar to what we did when we launched the new uh, mobile home programs last last year. We're going to hit the mail or hit the mail with with postcards, letting people know. But if there's if there is a, a way to kind of you know um, you know put something in, I know there's some newsletters or if there's some bulletins that that are are shared across the communities. Um, we'd love to know about those opportunities as well, and we could we will be creating like little blurbs that folks can kind of just drop into those newsletters, promoting the program and, for, and raising awareness. But yeah, we will be sending out something in the mail. Okay, well I, I guess I want I, I I'd like to suggest both to CHFA and, and really to the park owners, that um, I mean, part of what's amazing about this is that it's, a, I mean, this, this in some sense, this is the way United CT should have been run and it would have made it a lot easier for everybody if, if it was run this way. But um, 
from a park owner perspective, it would seem to me that as long as this program is in effect, um, there really should never be a need to evict somebody for non-payment. I mean, there may be other reasons to evict people, but there shouldn't be a reason to evict for non-payment because here's the money sitting there. And so it's, uh, uh, I guess my request is both to the park owners and to CHFA to figure out a way that in a sense, any non-payment eviction could be avoided because if someone would get the resident into the process, it would seem like they can get their rearage cleared and on top of that, they could get some help going forward. So it's, it's gonna minimize the risk, at least for the immediate future that they would fall back behind again. So this is a tremendous benefit, it seems to me, uh, to park residents, but it also is a way to keep the rent flowing into, to, you know, to, to, for those who own parks. So I would just encourage you to figure out if there are ways that you can supplement um, a postcard, which people may just throw away with, <clears throat> with something that goes out through park owners to their residents. And particularly, it could be targeted. I mean, a park owner can target a notice to, a re to residents who are behind in the rent um, in a way that you can't, because you don't know who's behind in the rent and who's not. Um, so I, I would throw that out. That's just, um, I mean, if pe for people to lose their place in a park because they're behind in the rent is really just, I mean, it's terrible because they've got to, that, that puts the home at risk. Uh, since there's no place to move it to. And um, so this, this would, would really, in terms of stabilizing people's lives, this is, this is a tremendous benefit. Um, could you, t could, um, I didn't write down the name. What is the name of the program? What is this called? Connecticut's um, program is called My Home CT. My Home CT, okay. Thank I'm you. going to suggest at this point we switch to Marcus and let him uh, talk to us a bit. And if there are further questions uh, uh, for Lisa, they can come in after Marcus. Yeah, I, I'm happy to cede my time, as it were. I, I, we have, we have, I don't really have much to update. I think we were hoping to kind of spend our time really talking about my OCT because it's the it's the thing that at, at CHFA we're really focused on getting getting up and out. So. Uh, you know, I, I can, if, if and when I have some, something more substantive, I, I can absolutely share it with the, you know, I can just send an email to Bennett and, or Colette yeah. and have it circulated. But yeah, I, I think we're having a good, getting good, really good questions here. I, I, I don't want to lose yeah. time on that. Well, so in that okay case, that. Uh, let, me, let me ask the other um, folks from the industry for their uh, reaction and how they think uh, they could be helpful in getting word out. So I do want to um, point out, and Marcus, you know, hop in here. We 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 will be having, you know, commercials. We will have a social media campaign. Um, the resource centers know about it. The state judicial system knows about the program. We've talked to the foreclosure judges, and we'll be talking to the mediators. Um, lawmakers across the state know about the program. Uh, we'll have uh, presence in newspapers, uh, radio. Um, there'll be like, a, like I, I said, there'll be a TV, there'll be some TV commercials. So, you know, we want to get this out to um, any citizen in Connecticut who, who needs help. We want to make sure that they know about the program and have the opportunity to, to apply. So in addition to some of these more targeted things that we're talking about here, that, you know, we'll have that kind of broader marketing and outreach campaign occurring as well. Um. You've had the floor for quite a while. Let Marsha speak for a second. Sure. Well, one of the things I wanted to say that we did this last time is when we send um, friendly reminders or delinquent notices, we reference the program in our letter to them that was available. So certainly if you have... Um, information or something already printed up that we could enclose with the letter that would work um, really well for us um, because you know we know we know who is having problems um, thank you it's a great program that's that's a wonderful news uh, other other park owners or industry folks Um, we have started some evictions once the eviction moratorium 
stopped. Um, we have some people who, for whatever reason, did not uh, work with, with Connecticut Unite. So I'm trying to figure out at this point, although the evictions are fairly new, um, you know, how, how quickly this can come along to, to halt things, you know. Um, so I guess, yeah, if you can send emails out to us and so that we could advertise it um, as quickly as possible, because we're obviously we're also paying legal dollars as this as this starts. I mean, I think it's great. Um, obviously, we wish it all had kind of coordinated with uh, Connecticut Unite so that there wouldn't be a, a, a break there. Um, and we, we also have homes that we rent out. So we're still working with those folks and trying to get some assistance for them as well, which um, once Connecticut Unite stop, that's, that's kind of it for the renters. Um, but the folks who own homes, certainly there's a few of them out there. Uh, Nancy, is there something you can do through the association? Um, it's the same thing we did with the um, Marcus's program. We can put it in the newsletter. Um, you have a meeting coming up? Yeah. Pardon me? Do you have a meeting coming up? We have a board meeting in April, but we don't have a large full membership board meeting uh, meeting until November. Other questions? Yeah, I guess I whenever whenever you're ready to let me go again, I, I have couple things. So Everyone you're anticipating else? this would, would be able to be advertised <laughs> mid-April? Is that what you're thinking? Kind of the, we can go with that? We are, uh, you know, hoping to roll this out within the next, you know, month, month or so. So yes, I, I, I think that's, you know, I, I, I can't give you uh, uh, that door is open date right now, um, but we are, we are working, you know, <laughs> very hard to get this rolled out as quickly and, and as well as possible. So the, prob the problem is, and I think what Miriam's alluding to is we're already in the process of evictions. And so you're right. going to find out that I think our, our concern is, and this is not your fault, that we surely appreciate that you're doing this. This isn't us complaining in any way. But what happens is if you've already notified the legislature folks and judges and they're going to say, oh, well, let's just kick the can down the road. We hear there's a program coming and now we've extended out what's already been months and more in some cases over a year worth of evictions. Um, and so we're, I think that's why Marion's trying to kind of lock it down, because as she said, we're spending an enormous amount of legal dollars to uh, process these evictions. And we don't want to get to court and find out they say, oh, there's a program coming and not knowing when the program's coming. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I I understand what you're saying, and I I can't predict what the court or a judge, um, you know, will do. It just we we did let judicial know that, you know, this is the program that we're rolling out, and and we you know we will be meeting with the mediators. I don't think rent has me. I I'm usually on the home the foreclosure side and not the the rental eviction side of of um, the business, so I don't know if there's mediation for a rental eviction. Um, but the mediators do know about the program as well. Hmm. Tracy, go ahead. Okay, good. Well, I just wanted to, to reinforce that the the the, the there are media it's a mediation program both for foreclosure and for eviction. I'm not sure to what extent it's the same mediators versus. I, I think that prime that at least they're assigned primarily <laughs> to one or the other although they may overlap some, so that in, in dealing with judicial, you should just be aware that there are different judges that are dealing with eviction and, and possibly different mediators that are dealing with foreclosure. So to make, just to make sure that notice gets to both. And then in terms of getting notice out to us, I, I, I don't think any of the park residents of the park residents are here for this meeting today. Al, Al is the only one who's present. Oh, okay. So. Uh, it, it, it is important that, that at least uh, 
we, we make sure that the residents that the residents who are represented here are able to do their own distributions in addition to any information that's going to go through others so um I, whatever whatever information becomes available i think it's important to get distributed to the to, to those on the con on the advisory councils list so that they can then redistribute further um if, if you all I, I, I guess I would, that information to me i'll make sure that it gets distributed to the entire council okay thanks and nancy uh nancy i'm wondering if you want to you might want to consider inviting chfa to to the april board meeting um so that at least the people on the board can directly ask questions unless there are, unless all the board is all here but uh to ask questions just to uh to lisa about the program because i i really do see the park owners as being very critical to the notice and outreach process um i mean certainly you know people like miriam or mark can buy <coughs> By, by kind of managing what's going to happen once they have a good sense as to when you're going to start um, can really, um, it becomes a way to keep people in place uh, and, and they can do it. A, a lot of the tenants won't have any legal representation in an eviction, for example, but if, but if the park owner, you know, says to the judge, we can wait because we know, and again, the more confidence this they have. It's definitely coming, yeah. yeah. That can be the vehicle not so much some general notice, but, it, but that, that the, the plaintiff in the eviction can clearly slow down the eviction if they're willing to do it, but they need to have confidence that something's coming and they, they'll, they'll get rewarded in the sense if they wait. Hey. Marcia? Um, I'm sorry. I was thinking we have a meeting in May, don't we? We have one in April. But do we in also May. have May? May, yes. It, that might work out a little bit better um, for Lisa because they will definitely have their program in place then by mid-April and that might have been a meeting. Okay. Yeah, just, just, just a thought on the timing of, you know, we wouldn't want to have you there, Lisa, and then it, it didn't apply yet, you know, or, or you didn't have a date yet. Just a, just a thought. Uh, I can or assure unless we you. move our meeting down a couple of weeks to make sure that we can, we have that information. I mean, however you want to do it. Sure. I mean, because uh, our meeting is going to be on what the fourteenth of April, I believe, yeah. of April second Thursday. Yep. So, depending, Lisa, if you feel you're you're not going to be quite up to it or have promo stuff for us or anything, I, I agree with with Marsha. Maybe we go into May. Sure, we are uh, happy to come and, and speak to you at May. I know Mark is, we'll, we'll have some marketing material, certainly before that, that, you know, and a, and a blurb that folks mm -hmm. can drop into, you know, your social media or, or newsletters or, you know, drop into the, um, the statements that you're sending out, the invoices that you're sending out to the, to the folks. Um, we can, we can get that to you, you know, sooner than later. Uh, With the, the website and where to sign up for information and, and things like that. Good. Mark, did you have something you wanted to add? No, I, I was just going to say, I, I, I promise you that there will be no delay on our end about distributing this information to the tenants. This is not something that's, you know, there's no, there's nothing in here to be against it in any way. The, what I had mentioned on the delay of the eviction process was just to kind of let let Lisa know that kind of part of our problem is going to be is that we're already the process of stuff. And as Rafi said, is, you know, how, you know, do you, are we willing to take the risk to slow down the process? I would say probably yes. You know, I'd rather get the money today than try to fight the, try, fight for the money tomorrow and potentially have to evict somebody. Or, you know, we don't make any money evicting anybody. That's, that's a fact. I mean, we, our soul, right. goes, or we make all our money from income, from rental payments, never from evicting somebody. So, uh, you know, Nancy and I will surely develop a plan to distribute it out, not only to the board members, but to the entire membership of the association. We'll do that right away. And then I think everybody agrees then, and, and Marcia said is we're going to put it out in any statements of delinquency that happens so we can, immediately stop the starting any process of eviction so you, you'll have that and i'll be honest with you i mean i i don't know maybe somebody knows from the state but 
you know, they were talking about the millions and millions of people that were going to be evicted when this thing all ended. And I, I don't see any of that happening. I, I see that a lot of landlords have made the effort to work with tenants, whether it was through Unite CT or payment programs or whatever. But, you know, overall, we've had very few evictions for the people that were chronically missing payments. Um, and we are starting a few today. And the people that were starting the evictions today basically refused to sign up for Unite CT. And they literally just said they weren't going to do it. For, I, don't, I can't tell you why, but I can't handhold every tenant and sit in front of their computer with them and make them apply. Um, all we can do is educate them. But you know, overall, the Unite CT program was a success. And this will, if this is easier to administer, this is going to be a home run for the next, for the last group of people who, for whatever reason, didn't get the money that they thought they were going to get the first round. Uh, uh, right. Lisa, Lisa, I just took a quick look at, at the website, uh, and I noticed that it doesn't, it gives you, on the entry page, it gives you a lot of things you could, I guess, click on. Uh, but if there's, at least there's nothing on that list that would suggest mobile home park residents are, are covered for, for rent issues. So you might want to take a look at that and see if there's, see if some other, some additional wording so it would be clear if someone from a mobile home park went there, they would be able to see that they were covered by the program. It talks about loans and mortgages, uh, condos, but it doesn't, I, I don't see anything, at least that if I were a park resident, I would recognize that the program applies to them. Uh, we, we will uh, take a look at the website and, and make sure that um, the qualified expenses is, is clear. Okay, thank you. Great. I'm going to, uh, at this time, uh, move us along. We have folks from the agency who I know uh, need to get on with other business, but um, any other questions come up, I'll be happy to relay them uh, to CHFA and um, uh, Lisa or Marcus, with wh whichever of you has uh, information for us, um, I'll, I'll be sure to distribute it to the council as soon as you provide it. Colette, if it's all right with you, we'll come back to the park closing just so we can move ahead with the agency. I just wanted to say thank you for your for your time. Oh, I appreciate it. Goodness, thank you so much. This is uh, the best news we've heard since the last time you had a new program for us. So keep it coming. We're, whatever you got, we'll take it. Okay. okay. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Lisa. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Uh, thank you, Pamela. At long last. Sorry, this was longer than we thought, but well worth it. I, I hope you'll agree. No, it's, it's definitely something that I need to hear as well. So I'm happy for that. Great. Thank you. So what can you share with us about complaints and inspections? Okay, so um, do you all have the report? So we can start off with the uh, report. If not, I can put that up. Yeah, we got it just the other day. And uh, it looks like all but one of them belong to legal, right? It's the only one. Uh, there were two that were, were legal I cases see, that went oh, from see, investigations over to legal. I see four at legal and one with you. Uh, Hi, Rock. Yeah, that's me. That, that's that been closed. I mean, it was just- uh, Yes, these are, these are closed reports. Yeah, okay. And uh, no new cases, it says. In Are there the, any questions? On? No. Uh, anything from the console? Um, otherwise we can move on to inspections. We're gonna hear from Cynthia on the legal, so you know, don't wanna get confused. Uh, okay, um, hearing none, Pamela, do you wanna just tell us where you are with inspections? Okay, so the new statute allows for us to inspect mobile homes, all the parks over the course of the year. Doesn't completely relieve us of our burden because we, as you know, we have one person who is dedicated to mobile home inspections but he is not full-time. He also has the professional boards that he investigates for. And then I have another special investigator who is uh, part-time. Um, 
So we're, we're plugging along. We do have our quarterly meeting scheduled next month so that we can figure out where we are and how much we need to, to do. And maybe if I have <clears throat> people to bring in, we'll, we'll do that. But we are also facing the challenge of this is a retirement season. I mean, we have a lot of people walking out the door between now and uh, June. I have a couple of supervisors, two special investigators. Um, I also have now real estate, real estate appraisers. So I have a lot of staff that, are, that I'm trying to replace. So we're working through this. Uh, we have, you know, it's a law we have to make sure it gets done. Um, so currently that's where we are. We are gonna be able to meet the new requirements. We, we are thankful to have it rather than having to do this all in December or upon receipt of a renewal, we now can work this over the course of the, course of the year. Um, so it's just, nothing has changed as far as the workflow goes. Our inspections are conducted. Um, we have a mobile inspection app, which we use, which allows us to take a photograph of any uh, deficiency that we might see or something that needs to be repaired. We're able to put that into a report and send that out to the park owner or the park manager. And they're given a specific time frame. You know, we work with them uh, to get the work done. So as long as that's happening, we're, we're good. But if someone either fails to respond or doesn't make the repairs in a timely manner, then we refer that to legal. In the same <laughs> instance, if it's something egregious, however, we would need to uh, consult with Cynthia, who is the attorney who handles mobile home parks and perhaps maybe take uh, swifter action. So nothing has changed in that regard. Pamela, can I ask, have you thought about how you're going to set priorities for this new rolling uh, inspection regime uh, that the statute permitted? Uh, set priorities? So well, we I mean, it, it, yeah, do you have a thoughts or have you put in place a plan that would say which ones you do first, um, <laughs> random, or how do you envision it? It is by territory. Of course, now we're not just doing the inspection, so we're also handling complaints. So that's the, the combination. So we might have, you know, someone write into us, we may conduct that inspection, we more than likely will conduct that inspection of Upon receipt of a complaint. So that takes care of both of the, the issues. We're going to go out and look at the residence issue and then while there, look at the entire park. Got so it. that's one of the ways that it drives our work. But then I also have territories that are assigned to uh, the investigators. So they can pick out the ones that they want to go to. If they happen to be in the area, maybe they're working on another case or whatever it is, they, they can do that. But if we do have, um, some that are placed, and you can see on a report, it may say file and monitor, or we've been out there last year, we were out there last year, and we need to follow up this year to see if you know, there's other issues. So it is managed by the investigator. So based on the inspection report history that we have attached to the credential. Okay, so arguably, if a park has been trouble-free for a number of years, the investigator would be able to, uh, in her discretion, put it at the bottom of the list and get through right. it. Well, you know, they haven't been, it's, we've seen the parks, okay? So even though we have this new statute, we're in April, you know, we, we actually saw the parks um, just months ago when we ran through the renewal inspections that we had to, to get through. So it's, none of these parks would have fallen off um, the radar for inspections because they've all been <clears throat> addressed in order to meet <laughs> The deadline and the Herculean task that we had, I myself had to, to inspect, and I, I roll up my sleeves and, and do the work with the, when needed. Um, I went out and inspected 11 of those parks myself. So um, they get done, uh, but, but it's, it, again, it will be based on the territory, based on complaints, and then random inspections. Right. So what, what complaints are always going to be, complaints are always going to be addressed first because there's an issue that someone is bringing to our attention that needs to be addressed. This is where they live. They see a violation every day or they're experiencing something with their uh, landlord or the park owner that, that needs to be addressed. So we would prioritize that first and then do the inspections second. 
Got it. Just one more question. I think around the time you took over this responsibility, um, the department had discovered uh, some missing parks. Parks yes. that, that had been um, licensed and all of a sudden weren't licensed, but maybe were under a different name, different owner, et cetera. Um, have you been able to get a handle on that or do you feel comfortable now that you can account for all the parks uh, on your list? I do. I feel uh, that we're a much better place than we were in 2018. Um, I, I, was, I had experience, past experience uh, with mobile home parks prior to taking over as a director. We did find, as you know, there was different name, different ownerships. We found that some of the parks are now developments for uh, single family homes that have fallen off. So we're keeping track of that. I have still, however, and I know you and I had the discussion of listing the address as the, the way to track it. However, our system is not uh, designed for that. And that would be the, the better way to go. Uh, I'll probably have to revisit that once enhancements are made, but it is still on the table, but it's not something that we're able to do at this moment. That's too bad because I think at least from our experience, those few years ago, uh, without without that address, uh, unless you're personally familiar with the location, uh, it's very hard to tell, uh, track the, the flow from one ownership or one address to another. So I would hope that um, your IT people could accommodate you. It doesn't seem like a massive request to put in another address field. Um, yeah, I know that they have that for, uh, I believe, for gas stations. So I don't know what it takes to to get that done. It is something that I, you know, was told couldn't do it right now, and I don't know if that's something internally or something with, um, you know, it costs money. I, I really don't know what those issues are, but I'll put it back on uh, for discussion as we can get to it. <laughs> yeah. Thank right you. now, you know, we have our list and we're plugging along. Uh, right now, it's um, as you know, Keith Lombardi is out doing doing inspections along with his other casework. Got it. Well, thank you. Other uh, questions for Pamela before we move to Cynthia? Thank you very much. Appreciate it and appreciate your patience in waiting. Cynthia, you're up. What can you tell us about- I'm here. Hello, how is everyone? Um, so I'll just go in order. Um, uh, the shoreline. Okay, so 2019-12 was the first um, mobile home park case that came up on the list. Um, this one was had several issues to it, um, and you know, before I go on, I just want to point out the case date is 2019, but it was inspected um, promptly. You know, the issue was addressed by investigations promptly. I also reviewed this file a long time ago, starting in like the end of 2020. I had been working on this file with the. Um, uh, park management, obtaining proof of repairs done and that kind of thing, but it's a, it was an extensive file, so it takes a while. Um, but I just want to clarify that it's, it hasn't sat for three years. Uh, it's It's been worked on continuously since. Uh, so this one, um, the biggest issue on this matter was an oil tank was illegally removed by the neighbor of the complainant. Um, the complainant moved out of the park, I believe at least two years ago now. Um, and she didn't respond to my attempts to get, um, get in touch with her. And I confirmed that she had already moved out at that point. Um, so there was an oil tank that was illegally removed with bleach in the um, protective casing, I guess, that's around the oil tank. So DEEP was called in. Um, they supervised the remediation of an oil spill that um, was a result of that removal. And they closed the matter. They inspected it and um, you know, approved the work that was done to remediate the spill. So that was really the big, biggest issue there. There were also a couple of um, smaller issues where the boundary line um, between the complainant and her neighbor, um, I guess there was some confusion on the, on the boundary line because once it was staked out, it turned out the complainant had um, you know, crossed over into the neighbor's lot. So that was fixed. Um, there was a water shutoff that was complained about, but that was done um, in an emergency and the water was restored in a timely manner. Uh, so there were a couple of smaller issues in that one, uh, but that was really the major issue. And the uh, 
the park management submitted proof of all of the repairs that were done as a result of the complaint. So that one was closed out. There were two more um, related to Shoreline um, that I'm still working on that were all from this same complainant. Um, I do have all of the proof that uh, the park management submitted on that also. I just, it's taking me more time to, you know, really confirm everything and close those out. Um, the next one was Green Acres. So this one, um, it's pretty straightforward. It was in 2019, um, the complainant made a complaint about what she thought were rats that had entered her um, unit from underneath the skirting of the home. And um, she complained to DCP and also contacted um, the Department of Health that went out and inspected. And they you know, confirmed that they didn't find any evidence of a rat infestation or any rodent infestation, but what they thought might've happened was her skirting around her home wasn't properly secured. And there's some pictures in the files, um, in the file on uh, the status of her skirting at that point in 2019. Um, they also, the park management also sent out, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, exterminator to inspect the, the area. They found no evidence of a rodent infestation, but since time had passed um, between the actual complaint and there was COVID and everything, and um, I believe it was assigned to me in 2021, um, I reached back out to um, the complainant. I spoke with her. She confirmed that the situation had improved um, since she initially submitted the complaint. And um, the park management sent out an exterminator again to inspect her area. I didn't find any evidence of, of road infestation, but in 2021, her skirting was still you know, loose around her unit. Um, so, that I closed out since it was, you know, addressed by uh, the park management and also the Department of Health they didn't find any um, evidence of a rodent infestation at that point. Um, the next one. Hey, Cynthia, was, can I ask you a question? Sure, sure. So in that in that instance, do you instruct the resident to fix the skirting up because we're not responsible to fix the skirting on their own home? Exactly right. That's actually um, in my email to her where um, I differentiated, you know, the, that the park owner is responsible to maintain the area um, that's not within the responsibility of the resident, but it's the resident's responsibility to maintain that skirting and to, you know, repair it and make sure it's tight. Yeah. Not allow any critters under there. But yeah, the, the Department of Health, as well as um, the exterminating company thought that maybe there were just some critters that got in there and it wasn't like a rat or mouse infestation. Um, next one was Grove Beach. Um, it's pretty straightforward. This was just a lot line dispute um, with a neighbor. Uh, it, it looked like the, the complainant didn't really understand the boundary line of her um, of her area, I guess, the, the management had planted shrubs to demarcate um, everyone's lot line, and she dug up those shrubs and planted uh, more shrubs beyond her lot line. And so, you know, when she was asked to move them back, that's when the complaint came in. And um, once the, the park staked out the actual, you know, parameters of her lot, it was, you know, became clear that she had actually exceeded the lot line by moving the shrubs and going crossing over into the neighbor's um, lot. So that was closed out with no enforcement actions. And, you know, the park owner did their part and planted the shrubs, but the resident, act, the complainant actually was the one that mistakenly did that. So, you know, that was closed out with no enforcement. And the last one, um, Lakeview, this one um, was inspected by investigations and they didn't find any violations. Um, but they uh, sent it to me just to double check because the uh, complainant was, I guess, pretty assertive that she wanted something actually done, but there weren't any violations found. There were a lot of um, complaints about, you know, a lot of hypothetical issues that she raised in her complaint that really are not within the parameter of the department to address. Um, such as, you know, wanting a future financial agreement just in case um, there's damage to her home from uh, water runoff. It was 
a lot of you know vague hypothetical complaints that really you know weren't something that we could address. Um, but there were a couple issues that uh, you know she raised that she had mold in her toilet, but then didn't allow um, the park management to get in and take a look at it or you know fix it if it were moldy. Um, she had complained that the underneath of her um, again with the skirting um, underneath her home that there was a moisture issue and that there was moisture coming through her unit. But then she also informed the park management that a contractor told her there was nothing wrong with her moisture barrier. And so the management actually went in there and you know pulled back the skirting and went under the home to double check and they said it was bone dry. There's pictures of it being bone dry. Um, there was really like no actual evidence of, of any water issues. Um, despite the complaints. Uh, so that I closed out, you know, as a result of both um, investigations not finding any issues and also um, the responses from park management that tried to address the issues that were raised, but then were kind of blocked by the complainant herself. And that's it. That gives you a good so indication much. on what we suffer from every day. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know that um, investigations made an effort to go out there and, and check on everything. And, you know, the park management did try to remediate any, you know, potential issues, but they just weren't either, you know, it was a non-existent issue because it was bone dry underneath the unit or she, you know, didn't allow them in um, to inspect the toilet that was supposedly full of mold. So they weren't able to really do anything about that if it was even an issue. So. Any uh, questions, comments for Cynthia? If not, Cynthia, thank you very much. And again, thank apologies you, for holding you later than we normally do. But again, I think mm -hmm. in a good cause. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if we go back to our agenda, Colette, um, we had hoped that we would uh, be able to uh, have a resolution meeting with you on the um, park purchase program, but mm -hmm. I gather that's still a work in progress. No, I think we're ready to go ahead and schedule that. Um, we do have some responses back to your latest comments and I can go ahead and send those out, but I do think we should just go ahead and try and get something on the calendar. Um, it would be nice if we could all kind of agree that we're working towards wrapping this up. I do think based on the comments that we've had back and forth, we're pretty close. Um, but I think at some point we either need to kind of agree to disagree on some of these smaller items or, you know, come to another resolution. But it would be nice if we could kind of get to the end of this review process so we can get it updated and Could, out there. Couldn't agree more. We're, we're okay. standing <laughs> by and ready to meet. So yeah, why don't you send me uh, the responses that you have? Um, mm -hmm. I'll circulate them and, uh, and and you and I will work out a potential meeting date so I can notify folks. Okay, that sounds great. We'll do this one remotely still. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're just starting to go back to the office in the next couple of weeks. So to be honest, I, you know, it's uh, um, a re-entry. <laughs> we're all getting used to and as far as comfortability level for meeting in um, conference rooms and things like that I think we still are being asked to wear masks so um, I think it would be best if we could go ahead and just plan on it being remote yeah I suspect that would be better for uh, some of our council members as well so, <laughs> um, that'll be good so yeah you and I can do this offline and we'll uh, circulate it okay right, thank you That's super yeah and again Please convey our <laughs> thanks, gratitude, shock, and pleasant surprise uh, yeah, to your agency I for presenting on. So that was really good news for me as well. Um, I'm glad that she was able to attend and get that information to you guys. Yeah, that's just amazing. Um, any questions for Colette before we move on? Okay, um, old business. Um, you know. I guess you'll remember some time ago that um, Senator Blumenthal's office contacted us uh, about an issue regarding um, Fannie's uh, duty to serve um, and the implications of, of uh, uh, 
REITs and other investors uh, taking over local parks, et cetera. Um, I solicited comments and we got, oh, I guess four maybe from members and I forwarded those uh, and offered to set up a follow-up discussion and um, there has been no response. I, I did a follow-up to my follow-up and there's been no response. So I assume that the Senator got what he wanted or changed his mind. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I, I don't think that we were really central to the broader concern of his subcommittee, actually. I think that was kind of tangential. So I wasn't surprised that there was no follow up. But obviously, if, uh, if it becomes hot and they come back to us, we'll uh, always uh, be willing to meet with the senator or his representatives. So <clears throat> I'll let you know, but I wouldn't hold my breath. Um, I had one item of new business that I put on the agenda um, before we get to that. Um, and it does look like we'll be able to wrap up pretty early today. Um, I wanted to see if council members had anything else they wanted to bring up since we have a little, little time. Old or new, uh, doesn't matter. Can't think of anything. If not, then I would like to uh, at least float the suggestion that um, as a council, we um, do some sort of step back and, and look at the landscape for mobile homes. We haven't done that in a while. Um, we've been very much in a reactive mode for a number of years. Um, and I think it'd be really good if we considered whether there might be a, one or two important areas of focus uh, that we could agree on and work together on uh, as a united council. Um, we seem pretty good at finding issues that we disagree on. We used to be really good at finding things we could agree on. I'm hoping we can identify at least one such important issue for the benefit of um, promotion uh, of an enjoyment of mobile homes in this state that would make it worth being here. Because yeah, quite frankly, I feel like we've gotten in a rut and uh, I, it's uh, easy I, to I do, agree. but Mark, please, yeah. So I don't know if this falls in our purview so you can tell me no. But um, I don't know if you guys are aware, but the state has a law, it's called 830G, it's the Affordable Housing Act. And mobile home parks actually aren't considered affordable housing in maybe all municipalities don't consider them affordable housing, which is you know somewhat ridiculous. There's a huge push right now from the state, I believe that all municipalities need to have a plan in place to, to meet the 830G, which is 10% of all housing stock must be deemed affordable within their towns. And I believe the majority of the towns do not fall, do not qualify for that 10%. So I believe multiple towns are now getting their housing committees uh, back together and they're trying to come up with a plan to submit to the state, I believe by the beginning of June uh, on how they're gonna fix their affordable housing uh, thing. Most of the towns in Connecticut don't allow you to add, you know, expanded more mobile home communities. <clears throat> in some respects, as an owner, there's a benefit to that because there's no more future competition. Um, so someone could say it's great, they're not building anymore and it makes my stuff more valuable. But at the same time, there's such a housing shortage today and affo an affordable housing shortage that, you know, maybe there's something we could do to present to the state or to whoever that our stuff is affordable housing. And I mean, if you look at what it costs today to build a stick built house based upon the cost of lumber and materials and how much we can place a single wide or double wide on a spot is a lot less um, than it would be if you were stick built. But I think that that's where we, you know, not in my backyard is probably the biggest thing that we face as an industry. Um, and so if there's any way to make that our push to, to present to whoever that, that the state should make our stuff you know, deemed affordable housing. So the towns recognize it as such and work with guys like me to buy land 
or come up with land that towns may be sitting on to build future communities. The problem with our industry is that it's, it's aging. You know, as much as we've put in a lot of new homes in a lot of our communities, a lot of these communities were built in the, you know, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, and that's really it. So you're really, you know, they age. They're starting to age, and we need to, it's part, probably part of the problem that our industry has is that it still has a trailer mentality when they're not trailers. So. Yeah, Mark, thank you. I think that's exactly the kind of thing I was hoping we would talk about. And I'm going to ask Rafi just to give us a little a reminder, um, I thought, in fact, that the law was changed so that mobile homes did count. Uh, that was done at the behest of Milford, as I recall. Maybe it didn't pass, right? Do you remember the? Unmute. I think it's more complicated um, than Mark said. I, I was, I was, <laughs> I'd raised my hand because I wanted to partially, to a large part, agree with Mark about is analysis, but not about it. I think it's a mistake to try and link this to 8-30G because there are a lot of reasons for, for not including um, the, uh, units that are not in some way deed restricted or government assisted. But the, the, uh, we have a statute in 8-2 that prohibits discrimination, zoning discrimination against um, essentially against mobile home parks if all the units in the park are at least 22 feet wide. And we've at various times um, looked at trying to, to, first of all, kind of examining the question as to what, what does that 22 foot wide requirement, what kind of impact does that have? And is that something that we would, it would be beneficial if that were lowered? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if all mobile homes are 22 feet wide or not. Um, the, the, so when, when they adopted that, they actually almost voted for 15 feet wide. And then that, that somebody is a compromise 25 years ago, um, you know, pushed it up to 22 feet. Um, also there's, we, we, again, many years ago, we, as a, as a, an advisory council spent a lot of time examining if there are ways that we could get the existing statute enforced because of the belief that, I mean, we looked at, someone at some point looked at municipal zoning ordinances and found many that explicitly discriminated. I mean, it had provisions that said this, you know, the right to, to, to produce something does not include a mobile home park. And that's patently contrary to the existing state statute. So some working in that area, Mark, that you've described, um, the, the, the sort of the exclusionary use of zoning to keep mobile home parks out. I think that's the common area that we can work in. I, I don't want to go through the whole 8-30G thing, but um, the, the uh, mobile home parks that are, that meet the general standard for the kind of deed restriction that you have to have do count for all purposes in 8-30G. And there has been at least one, I think in Oxford uh, litigation over uh, the creation of a mobile home park there. That went on for years. Right, right. And so, but, but the issue of whether undeed restricted housing should ever be counted towards 8-30G opens up an enormous can of worms because all the towns that want to get out of 8-30G without producing any new housing keep saying, well, we've got some places that rent, they're pretty cheap. Why don't we get to count them? And the answer is because they're not restricted. It's a, it's a narrower count, but it's intended to produce a much wider range of housing. It's not like everything, in any sense, I'm just saying that's sort of, you'll end up with the housing advocates being against the proposal if it's tied to 8-30G, but I think they'll be in favor of a proposal if it's not tied to 8-30G, but is essentially- Rafi, what about the fair share legislation that folks are, are pushing? The, I'm uh, sorry, the what? The fair share legislation? Yeah, fair, fair, sh uh, fair share, I think, I, I think we have to look at exactly how it's written, but the, the, certainly the supporters of fair share would, if it's brought to their attention, would see mobile home parks as, as an element of something they would like to see happen. Uh, I'm not sure, I mean, one of the issues for those, for the supporters of that um, is indeed, how do you interrelate fair share with 8-30G? And I think they see 8-30G as kind of a backup muscle um, to get fair share to work. So um, I mean, they've been very clear that it's not one or the other, it's that you need both. Uh, but, but in terms of 
of how exactly they, they would count, uh, under what circumstances a uh, mobile home park would count as a fair share unit. I actually don't know because I haven't thought about that and I haven't really, uh, a lot of the bill this year is to delegate things to OPM. Um, and so I think there's, there's not the same degree of specificity as there was in a proposal last year. But yeah, that might, Ben, it's a good point. If that's something. If, if I could suggest, if, if we are ever going to get to a place of, of unity, I think it's critical that we focus on where we can agree on a critical uh, goal. And I think the, the promotion of mobile homes, the elimination of discrimination against mobile homes, the enforcement of the existing statute, the amendment of the existing statute. Those are the kinds of things we can start with. And then when we get down to the how exactly do we implement it, um, we'll have a, a strong common bond and we'll have to negotiate out conflicting interests over you know, what's the best vehicle, who, who are the best allies. But I think our starting point would be among ourselves to come to some clarity about what would be the best thing for residents and park owners jointly um, to finally bust through. We are so far behind many other states. You know, this fair share legislation that we're talking about is modeled after stuff that went on in New Jersey. When I was in law school, I won't tell you how many decades ago that was. Uh, you know, so this is, we're, we're, we're just way, way behind. So there, this is the moment, I think, Mark, um, where I, I agree with you. There, the, 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 the iron's hot right now. There's the shortage of housing in this country is precipitated the, us, uh, this timing for us that I don't think could be any better. Yeah, and what the pa pandemic has done is it's exacerbated that. Um, the, the latest data on increases in uh, prices of, of housing in Connecticut and the uh, virtual lack of, of anything on the market, right? I mean, yeah. it, so clearly we, we, have, we have stalled out um, and, and there's a great need for, um, you know, affordable housing um, of all types. And, and we're not the solution, but clearly we have something critically important to offer. So I think that's a great, great issue. Um, obviously we don't have everybody here. I'm hoping we'll, we'll have a, our next meeting. If, if we promote this as the topic that we might get, get everyone to show up um, and we could spend some time uh, talking through what, what we think would be desirable. Um, and, and then maybe we can um, form a committee to do some further exploration and see if we can uh, find some allies that we can work with. Yeah, exactly. So that you know, people who've already been toiling in, in these fields. Um, so I think that's one idea. I would welcome just in a few minutes and let's be sure we'll get out of here by 11.30. Uh, any other ideas that members have uh, for issues? Um, certainly on the affordability side, CHFA has taken us a long way towards what we've always talked about with the possibility of getting you know, mortgage type rates uh, for the purchase of individual homes. Um, and, and if that gets off the ground, one, one hopes that it's gonna encourage uh, other uh, lenders uh, to get into the act as well. Um, but I don't know, I'm just throwing that out. What, what else is, do people see? Uh, Al, you've been awfully quiet during the call from a, and, and you're the sole resident uh, member here today. Um, anything um, that you and your members are, are really interested in? that we should put on the list for discussion next time? He's thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Al, while you're thinking, uh, any other members have, have some thoughts to put on the table? Uh, you know, I, I certainly agree with, uh, you know, Mark's initial um, 
uh, thoughts on where we are with the industry. You know, one of the things that the council is charged with is promoting the industry. And I think that needs to be behind everything that we do. Um, I don't know if there's something that's um, more visible that we can, you know, do to promote the industry. I know we We've had an education committee in the past, you know, uh, updating the website, things like that. But um, this may require a, a little bit, you know, a longer discussion and a bit more creativity than I may have. But, uh, you know, just something to keep in the back of our mind that, you know, how can we um, promote our industry? How can we change that perception, as Mark said, not in my backyard? or people that might be thinking about retiring, that this is a good option for them. Um, I think it's something we need to uh, delve into a little bit more. Yeah, I think that's another great idea. Um, DOH is, is a member of the council specifically for that purpose. DCP not seeing that as within their purview. Um, you know, when the council was first created, CHFA and DOH were added to uh, help with affordability and promotion. And, you know, obviously uh, CHFA has been doing a phenomenal job of helping out. Uh, DOH, uh, far less so, um, maybe we can really bring them to the table um, and, and see what, what their interests might be in that regard. So I think that's another uh, re certainly related to Mark's idea. I, I don't think it's in either or. I think they go together pretty well. Um, any other thoughts from, from any council members? So I, if, if not, I, I think what I'll do is um, send out a, uh, an, an email uh, to the members um, saying that we'd like to devote a substantial section of the next meeting uh, to this topic and, um, and solicit any uh, other ideas uh, by email, you know, get people to reply all so that we all have a chance to think about things uh, before we meet. Does that sound like uh, a good use of our time? Yep, sounds it good. Does. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, anything else uh, on people's minds? If not, well, thank you and 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 thanks again to CHFA. Uh, <laughs> the surprises never end. Yeah, <laughs> really, it's just just incredible. Thank you, thank you. Have I a thanks, everyone. Nice. Nice spring, everybody. Thanks, Bennett. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.